Friends, let us unite in the public worship of God. And we do so as we turn to sing from Psalm 139. Psalm 139, we're singing from the beginning of the psalm. The psalm that speaks of God's intimate knowledge of us, our circumstances, our uh, situation in life, right down to the most minute details. Psalm 139, Stephen, would you sing this? Uh, from the beginning of the psalm, O Lord, thou hast me searched and known. Thou knowest my sitting down and rising up. Yea, all my thoughts afar to thee are known. Down to verse 10, six stanzas. O Lord, thou hast me searched and known. <coughs> <coughs>
pray. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our gracious God, we pray today for the leading and help of God's Spirit so that we will be able to come as true worshippers, not merely going through the outward motions, but having in our hearts a desire to worship and to meet with the living God. We crave the leading and help of God's Spirit so that we will be taught humility, awe and reverence, and that we will be taught too the need to confess our sin even as we come. For we know, eternal one, that sin stands as a great barrier between ourselves and a holy God. But there is a Saviour, and that Saviour has perfected his own work so that there is a way of peace and reconciliation with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We give thanks for the coming, the dying, the rising again of our Lord. We give thanks for his continued intercession, and we acknowledge, O oh Lord, today that he alone is our hope. He alone is the ground of our approach to God. We come through him as our mediator. And we trust in his shed blood to cover sin. Bless, O oh Lord, thy people as they come to another Lord's day in their own experience. Cleanse them from sin. Deliver them from temptation assist them in trouble remember those of them who are unwell any with troubles and problems in their hearts and lives prove thy grace sufficient and minister to them day by day we pray eternal lord for any who are searching and seeking for the lord who long to say that they have peace with god but who do not have any inward confidence to say so Help them, O Lord, to see that it is not our feelings which come and go that count, but the promises of Christ, which are sure and certain. Remember those who are as yet unconverted. We pray, eternal Lord, for the power of God's Spirit to work in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls. And, O oh Lord, we do pray that we might see a work of God's power in our own midst here. And that in our homes and families, our kith and kin, we would see lives transformed by God's power and grace. We pray, Lord, for the work of the gospel in our own denomination, here in Scotland, in the UK, and to the ends of the earth. We pray for blessing upon the mission work of Christ church, whether to the Jews who first received the word of God or to the Gentile world that has come to share in it as well. Oh Lord, we pray for the establishing of gospel churches, the promotion of all that is good in church and state, and the demotion of all that is bad in the same. We pray, Lord, for circumstances of particular need, areas of war, and it's on our doorstep in Europe, and in many another place across this world, we pray, Lord, for those who seek to bring peace and to bring aid as well, and those who, in the midst of these desperate situations, seek to bring the light and the word and the work of the gospel eh, to bear as well, for that ultimately is a solution to man's need, Christ and him crucified. That is what reconciles men to God and indeed man to man. Remember, Lord, the our own nation and those who govern us in the different levels of society. We pray eternal Lord for blessing, particularly on those who seek to uphold and promote all that is good and in accordance with the word and the will of God. Be with us now, Lord, as we come. Lead us into worship, assist us in worship and assist us in the extra concerns and duties and events of this day. We are thankful, Lord, for this day in the history of the congregation. 
And we pray God's blessing now upon the word as we handle it and upon the other events that will follow after. Lord, lead us and guide us. Cleanse us from sin, the sin that is within that is so subtle, the sin that is without and shows itself in words and in thoughts and in a, their, their absence as well at times. Sin is such an ugly thing, but a mercy that God saves his people from their sins and not in their sins, and that he works in them to take away the power and even ultimately the presence of sin when his work in their hearts and lives is finally done. Hear us, Lord, and draw near to us. Cover our sin and receive us freely. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to read together now in God's word. Sorry, friends, I think I switched this off earlier and didn't switch it on again. That's better. We're going to read together now in God's word in the scriptures of the Old Testament and in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The book of the prophet Jeremiah, and we're going to read in chapter 1. Jeremiah in chapter 1, and we'll read from the beginning of the passage. <clears throat> Jeremiah and chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, to the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord to me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething or a boiling pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall let every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise, and speak to them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city 
and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against all the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. But I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. We trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his holy and inerrant word of truth. We turn to sing again now in that same psalm, Psalm 139. We're singing just now from verse 13 and we'll sing down to verse 17. Alistair Patterson, would you keep us singing, please? Psalm 139 and singing from verse 13. Down to verse 17, six stanzas. Again, he speaks here of God's knowledge of him. And we saw in our reading that the Lord said to Jeremiah that he knew him before he was born. And David is saying the same thing here. His, his very being, his very frame in his mother's womb, known so intimately, long, long before. From verse 13, for thou, six stanzas, for thou possessed. Ask my reins. <laughs> Ah, 
friends, seeking the Lord's help and the light of God's Spirit, we turn again to God's Word and to that passage that we read together, the book of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, and we'll read just now at verse 4. We'll read down a number of verses there from verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And so on, down to verse 10. Anathoth, the town or village that's mentioned in verse 1, was about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. And it was there that the prophet Jeremiah was born. We also learn from verse 1 that uh, he belonged to a priestly family. We're told that he was the son of Hilkiah, who was one of the priests uh, of the Old Testament church. And so in the ordinary nature of things, Jeremiah would have grown up and would eventually have taken his own place amongst those priests who served the Lord. But the Lord had ordained that the young Jeremiah was not simply going to spend his life in Old Testament priesthood, for the Lord had other work for this man to do. And while he was still a young man, maybe about 20 commentators reckon, maybe a little older than that, but still a young man in any case, we read here that the Lord called him to be a prophet. Now, the prophets of the Old Testament didn't just foretell. They sometimes did that. They would prophesy things that were to come. But the greater part of their work was not so much foretelling, but what we might call forthtelling or preaching, declaring God's will, instructing the people in the ways of God, and generally being a spiritual leader in the nation. Now, as we come to these verses today on this special day in the history of the congregation, as we come to set apart two men to the office of eldership and leadership in the congregation, I want to look at two things. I want us to look, first of all, at Jeremiah's response to God's call to service and office. How does Jeremiah re Spond. And children, if you've got your sheets, this is the first thing on your sheets there. Jeremiah's response. Well, nobody could accuse Jeremiah of self-promotion or ambition. In fact, when God's call comes to him to office, he's very reluctant. In fact, we see in the verses here, that he's even afraid. He didn't want to be a prophet. And if there was an honorable way out, I'm sure Jeremiah would have taken it. So what was he afraid of? Well, can I suggest that he was afraid of two things essentially? First of all, he was afraid of himself. He was afraid of himself. The task that he was given was very demanding. We've seen already that he belonged to the priestly families and he would be expected in process of time to serve in the priestly office and uh, to take on these duties. Now these duties, they were, they were very solemn duties but they were relatively straightforward. 
We've seen that even on Wednesday nights in our study of the tabernacle. And we've been looking at the way that some of the things that priests would do in the Old Testament. There was a huge amount of repetition. It was relatively straightforward day after day. But the prophetic work, this work of leadership to which he was being called, was very different. It was much more demanding and much less predictable. You couldn't be just so sure what the Lord would call on you to do or what the circumstances might be. He would have to address the people, for instance. And he wasn't coming to them with a sugar-coated message that they would all applaud loudly. At times, he would have to speak to them and deliver God's word, and they wouldn't like the message that he would deliver. And as you read on in the book of Jeremiah, that's exactly what happened. He knew very well that he might even have to address the leaders in the land, even the royal court, even the king itself. And Jeremiah says in verse 6, here's his response. Ah, Lord God, I cannot speak. I am a child. Now, he wasn't literally a child. But he feels so inadequate so ill prepared for the task that he might as well be a child. He's saying to the Lord with all respect, I'm the wrong man. I'm not fit or ready or equipped for any of this. Perhaps when he heard that he was to be a prophet, he compared himself to some of the old prophets that he'd have heard of. He would have thought maybe of Moses, that wonderful man of God. And he'd have said, well, I'm no Moses. I'm not remotely like Moses. Or he might have thought of uh, uh, Elijah, another great Old Testament spiritual leader. And he would have said, well, I'm not an Elijah, not even remotely. In comparison to these men, I'm a child. And maybe brethren, and I'm speaking particularly to you too, maybe you feel the same way today. Inadequate, ill-prepared in yourself. Maybe you're afraid of yourself, as you know your own failings and weaknesses. And you know them better than anybody else does. Jeremiah is afraid of himself. But Jeremiah has another problem. He's also afraid of others. He knew very well that it was more than likely that there would be difficulties and problems ahead. Will I be able to manage? Will I be able to cope when these issues come? And you didn't need to be a prophet to see problems ahead. Jeremiah was born during the reign of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings to ever reign in Jerusalem. He was a violent murderer. He caused the streets to run with blood at one point. Now Manasseh, we believe the Lord worked in Manasseh's life, but he left terrible results behind him. And eventually Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, would become king. And we're told in verse 2 that Jeremiah was called to the work of the prophet in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. So we can date it exactly. Now Josiah was a good king. And he was able to some extent to bring reformation and improvement spiritually into the land. And to a degree, the people were led back to God. 
but it didn't really go very deep. It was only outward, and when Josiah died, the nation went back to its bad old ways. And those who succeeded Josiah as king were not good men. And very soon, very, very soon, the last king would reign in Jerusalem. And soon enough, the nation would be broken up. Jeremiah could see how things were. And he was afraid. And the vision that the Lord gives him of the boiling cauldron in verse 13 only confirms that. The Lord says there's trouble coming from the north. And we know how that's going to end. The rise of the mighty empire that would bring Jerusalem to a heap of rubble. And that would see its people carried away captive. And by Babel's streams they would sit and they would weep when they remembered Zion. These were difficult times. And Jeremiah knew it. Idolatry had to be confronted. Open breaches of God's law had to be confronted. Spiritually, things looked bleak. And nationally and internationally, things looked very ominous. War was just over the horizon. The leaders of the nation, they were not friendly towards the things of God. And they would not be friendly towards Jeremiah. He was afraid what they might say to him. What they might do to him. Now the men that we are setting apart today for leadership. They don't have these sort of challenges. But these are not easy days either. They are not easy days. Spiritually. So that's Jeremiah's response. But secondly I want us to notice. The Lord's reply. And there are three parts to the Lord's reply. First of all, there's a divine prompt. Now, you know what a prompt is? Maybe, maybe the younger ones answer you what a prompt is. A prompt is, is when you're just told to do something. Maybe you're in school and, and the teacher says, get on with your work. Or maybe at home, somebody says, get on with it. Go and do it. And you know, the Lord gives Jeremiah a prompt. He's going to give him more than a prompt. But he gives him a prompt. Verse 7. And the Lord said to me, Say not I am a child. Don't say I'm a child. Jeremiah, you're looking in the wrong place. What's the first thing Jeremiah says? I. Me. Myself, Jeremiah, you take your eye off I and me and myself, and you move your eye to the God of heaven. You will go, he says in verse 7, and you will speak. It's a divine prompt. This is a task. This is the task that I'm giving you. I'm not asking you. I'm not putting out feelers to see if you'd like to be a prophet. I'm telling you. I'm appointing you. I'm sending you. I'm your divine master. I'm the divine appointer. I'm the captain. I'm the king. You may doubt yourself, but don't doubt me. You may question yourself, Jeremiah, but 
Don't question me. Don't say, I'm just a child. There's a divine prompt. But secondly, the Lord gives him in verse 8 a divine promise. Be not afraid of their faces. I am with thee to deliver thee. What a blessing it wasn't just a prompt he got. Go and do it. Because the Lord follows that up with a promise. I know you're afraid, Jeremiah. But don't be afraid. Because I will be with you. I'll be behind you, covering your back. I'll be before you into every situation. I'll be beside you as you do my work. I have sent you. Do not be afraid of their faces. Now, why does he say their faces? Why doesn't he say don't be afraid of their hands? Because their hands could do lots of things. Well, faces intimidate, don't they? A face can put you off or encourage you. As Jeremiah would declare God's word, not everyone would welcome his message. He would have to meet unwelcome faces in the crowd. Some faces would register boredom at Jeremiah's message. And if you read on, that's, that's what happened. That's one of the things that happened. They said it's always the same things, Jeremiah. Doom and gloom. They said we're bored with this message. Tell us something else. Now they had other prophets and other preachers in that day. And they had other things to say. They said, oh, don't worry, it'll all work out. Tragically, it didn't all work out. And everything Jeremiah said was fulfilled. But some of their faces might register boredom. Don't be put off, Jeremiah. Some of their faces might register amusement at Jeremiah's message. They would laugh at him. They would sneer at him. Some of their faces would get hard. They would reflect anger. At Jeremiah's message. <laughs> Hatred. And Jeremiah says I'm afraid of their faces. I'm afraid to face them. Don't be afraid Jeremiah. You look at my face. And the more you look at my face. The less you will fear their faces. And that's as true today as it was in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. There's a divine prompt in verse 7. There's a divine promise in verse 8. Finally, there's a divine provision in verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. It reminds us of the coal that touched the lips of Isaiah, and it's the same idea. I know where your weak point is, Jeremiah, and he touches it. God is equipping. He's giving Jeremiah all the power, all the grace, all the authority, all the means that he would require. I'll give you all the words you need. He says the same to you, brethren. I can put out my hand and touch and equip and provide. He came and he touched him. 
Derek Kidner in his commentary in Jeremiah makes an interesting point. God's dealings with his people, he says, aren't at arm's length. He comes very close. All the words, all the wisdom, all the grace that you are required, I already have them. And I'm able to communicate them as you need. And he says to his church still, the one who touched Jeremiah in the 13th year of Josiah's reign is still able to touch his people in the 70th year of Queen Elizabeth's reign. The natural limitations which Jeremiah feared would be seen as nothing in the face of the touch of God. There's a divine prompt in verse 7, a divine promise in verse 8, a divine provision in verse 9. And behind all three, there in the background is God's electing grace that he refers to in verses 4 and 5. Jeremiah, I've known you from all eternity, he says. Before you were conceived, I had already set you apart for this work. This was all in the divine plan, in God's master plan. I knew it from all eternity. You didn't know it till the 13th year of Josiah's reign. But I, the Lord, reign, and all my servants are appointed in my grace and in my wisdom before the foundations of the world. And all we're doing here today is part of that master plan as well. From all eternity, the divine potter preparing and shaping the clay of Jeremiah's life for this moment. We were singing in Psalm 139, behind before thou hast be set and laid on me thy hand. Jeremiah hadn't planned it. And neither friends did you. But this passage is telling us that the Lord planned it. And he's brought you to this point. Just as he brought Jeremiah. To that point. And you know, Jeremiah's fears, they brought blessing. They brought humility. And the humility in turn brought help. His first answer was, I can't. And maybe that was your first answer too. But the Lord says, the Lord comes and he says, I know Jeremiah. I know you can't, but I can. Jeremiah is saying, who is sufficient for these things? And hundreds of years later, the Apostle Paul says exactly the same thing. Who is sufficient for these things? 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 2. And he answers his own question in the next chapter. Our sufficiency is of God. The name Jeremiah means God establishes or God appoints. And he did establish. 
He established Jeremiah and his ministry. He provided for him and he cared for him to the very end. Jeremiah means established. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3. The Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Jeremiah's response and the Lord's reply may God bless his word to our hearts. We unite together. Eternal Lord, we give thanks for this part of God's word, which mirrors our own circumstances and feelings in so many ways. What a day it was for Jeremiah in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah when he found himself called to leadership. But we read on and we see God keeping and providing day by day and year by year. And so it is still. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot heed. Be with us as we continue in the Rest of the service with its own duties, hardening sin, and leading us and receiving us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, before we move on to the next part of the service, we're going to sing to God's praise in Psalm 119. And from verse 73, Alistair McLeod, would you read the sing? Um, Psalm 119 and at verse 73, we'll sing four verses down to 77. Uh, here's the psalmist and he's reflecting in some ways what Jeremiah had said, thou madest and fashioned me, thy laws to know give wisdom, Lord. So who thee fear shall joy to see, me trusting in thy word. That very right thy judgments are, I know and do confess. <clears throat> that thou hast afflicted me in truth and faithfulness. O Lord, let kindness merciful, I pray thee, comfort me, as to thy servant faithfully was promised by thee. And there he is, he's relying on the promises of God, just as Jeremiah could do. And let thy tender mercies come to me, that I may live, because thy holy laws to me sweet delectation give. 73 to 77, thou madest and fashioned me. Love
Friends, at this point, I am required to give you a brief a summary of the events that have led us to this point, and I can do so very quickly. You will recall the steps that were taken for the addition of elders in the congregation. In the edict that I read just before the service began, I refer to the meeting of the Kirk session in March and then the congregational meeting that followed it. At the end of that meeting, the Kirk session told me that he directed me that evening to read an edict last Lord's Day at both diets of worship, and that was done. I further read the edict this morning, giving notice to anyone who might have any objections to the life or doctrine of Mr. Ian Campbell and Alistair Nicholson to substantiate these at the meeting of the Kirk session. No objections having been intimated, the Kirk session is now in a position to proceed to the ordination and induction of Mr. Ian Campbell and Mr. Alistair Nicholson. Could you both please stand? Now, there are vows, promises to be made. You have both served in the diaconate, so you have already affirmed these promises, and they are the same. But I shall put them to you again as you enter a new office. Number one. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and the only rule of faith and manners? I do. Do you sincerely own and declare the confession of faith, approved by former general assemblies of this church, to be the confession of your faith? And do you own the doctrine therein contained to be the true doctrine which you will constantly adhere to? Do you own and acknowledge the Presbyterian church government of this church by Kirk sessions, presbyteries, provincial synods and general assemblies to be the only government of this church? And do you engage to submit thereto, concur therewith and not to endeavor directly or indirectly, the prejudice or subversion thereof. Number four, do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, as King and Head of the Church, has therein appointed a government in the hands of church officers, distinct from and not subordinate in its own province, to civil government, and that the civil magistrate does not possess jurisdiction or authoritative control over the regulation of Christ's church? And do you approve of the general principles embodied in the claim declaration and protest adopted by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1842, and in the protest of ministers and elders commissioners from presbyteries to the General Assembly, read in the presence of the Royal Commissioner on the 18th May, 1843, as declaring the views which are sanctioned by the word of God and the standards of this church with respect to the spirituality and freedom of the Church of Christ and her subjection to him as her only head, 
and to his word as her only standard. Do you promise, fifthly, to observe uniformity of worship and of the administration of all public ordinances within this church as the same are at present performed and allowed? I do. Sixthly and finally, do you accept the office of an elder of this congregation and promise through grace, faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully to discharge all the duties thereof. Well, I never put these vows on anybody else, but I feel their weight on my own shoulders. Now, not only do office bearers give a public assent, which they do. But they also sign a formula, which is essentially a summary of what they have just promised. They are not only giving their assent to it verbally, but they are committing themselves in writing to it as well. We unite together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal and ever blessed Lord, we have reached a very solemn moment in the life and history of the congregation, but also a very happy moment. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for the provision of men. And we pray, Lord, that, that the one who has provided them will provide for them and that his grace will prove sufficient so that even if they say and feel very much that they are but children, that they will feel today that the Lord is the one who is able to touch and graciously help. We do pray for them, Lord, as they are set apart in this moment to office in the Church of Christ. O oh Lord, watch over them. Guard and keep them. Keep them humble. Keep them faithful. Keep them ever looking to the Lord. And grant that as they take up tasks and duties, they might be very conscious of these things. Remember their families, their wives. And we are thankful, Lord, that in both cases, their wives are with them in spiritual things and that they are one and that is a help we pray eternal lord that they might know blessing in the home that it would be blessed to their children and their children's children and remember <coughs> we pray eternal lord all of us who watch on who are witnesses to these events 
Help us to help them. And grant that as we pro progress together, we shall know much of the Lord's help and the Lord's leading. Cover our sin now. Watch over us. Pardon us. Lead us as little children. For Jesus' sake. Amen. If you remain upstanding, please. In the name of the Kirk Session, by authority of the Divine Head of the Church, I do receive and admit you, Mr. Ian Campbell and Mr. Alistair Nicholson, to the office of Elder in this congregation. And as a token of our good wishes in the Lord, I extend to you, first of all, the right hand of fellowship. Thank you. Thank you. The other members of the session will join me in so doing, so if you go around and shake their hands as well. Come out. Now, if both of you remain standing for a moment, but everybody else can take a seat. I want to take a moment or two to address you relative to your duties. Now we've touched on this already, so I'm not going to go into any detail. When we met in March, we dealt extensively that evening with the office and work of eldership. But I want to direct your attention just to one verse. You'll find it in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11. My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him. My sons, be not now negligent. Reference was made last night in prayer, in the prayer meeting to King Hezekiah. And these words that we have here are the words of King Hezekiah. They were spoken around the year 715 BC. And they were addressed to the priests who served the temple in Jerusalem. And he was encouraging them to press on in the work that the Lord had given them. They were addressed to them in difficult days. Just as we saw with Jeremiah. So in the days of Hezekiah, the national situation wasn't good. Hezekiah's father had been called Ahaz. You read about him in chapter 28 and in verse 24, I think, where it tells us that he gathered all the vessels of the house of God and he cut them in pieces and he shut up the doors of the house of God and he made altars idol altars on the corners of the street. The national situation was, was bad. And it's still bad, spiritually. The international situation in Hezekiah's day wasn't good. And inevitably, the spiritual situation wasn't good either. There's really nothing new under the sun. There were problems in the days of Hezekiah. We go further forward to the days of Jeremiah and there's problems. It's a broken world. We're no longer in Eden. We will never be back in Eden in this world. Thorns and thistles, the problems of sin. 
Now, maybe these men here in the days of Hezekiah wished that they had lived in other times, that they had served the Lord when, when things were easier and things had been easier in the past. Well, that's the wrong attitude. We're in the time and the place in which the Lord has set us. The grass isn't always green on the other side. They were addressed to them in difficult days, but they were also addressed to them in days of new beginnings. Hezekiah is saying it's a new beginning. He's reopened the house of God. He's turned back some of the things that previous generations had done wrong. But they weren't a huge group. You read the names in verses 12 to 14, 14 of them. It wasn't a massive group. But it's amazing the influence that these men had under the Lord. Never underestimate what God can do with a few consecrated people who serve him faithfully. You read the next chapter and you'll see how the Lord used these men and used them to bring a blessing to Jerusalem. My sons, be not negligent. Use your talents and your time for his cause. For the Lord has chosen you. In one sense, the congregation chose you. The Kirk session chose you. But in the highest sense, the Lord has. And as he said to Jeremiah, those he chooses and appoints, he will provide for. My sons, be not now negligent. Well, may the Lord help you as you serve him here. You may take a seat. I'm also required to say a word to the congregation. And if you turn to chapter 30, the following chapter of 2 Chronicles and verse 1, we read there that Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover. In other words, Hezekiah is saying, Come and support these new Levites in their work. And that's what he's saying to us. Do all you can to help them. Do all you can to encourage them. Imagine if the folks hadn't come after these Levites had been appointed and the Passover is arranged. Imagine if the people hadn't come. How very, very disappointing. But they came. And you can read about it this afternoon in the chapter. What God did in those days. Help them prayerfully. Help them practically. The Lord gave these men. A heart for the work in the days of Hezekiah. And behind it all was the hand of God. And we're going to sing of that in a moment. In the words of Psalm 72. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel. That they should come to the house of the Lord. At Jerusalem. But may God bless his word. To our hearts. We'll sing now in these words. Psalm 72. And we're going to sing the closing verses. From verse 17. 72 and from 17. The three stanzas to the end. His name forever. Shall endure. His name.
I'll stand for the benediction and then I'll deal with intimations. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of God the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Just give me a moment. <clears throat>